It is one year after the crucifixion of Jesus. And this man is about to be stoned to death. His name is Stephen. He is a Christian. Watching the execution is a young Jewish tent maker named Saul. In his view, Stephen is a blasphemer and deserves to die. Stephen is the first follower of Jesus to choose death rather than renounce his beliefs. Thus, he becomes the first Christian martyr and, almost automatically, one of the first Christian saints. October 1982, Rome. A new saint is being added to the calendar of the Roman Catholic Church. His name is Maximilian Kolbe, a Polish priest who was killed at Auschwitz during World War II when he volunteered to take the place of a Jew who had been condemned to death. La morte per martirio del padre Massimiliano Kolbe. With this ceremony, Colby officially joins the ranks of some 10,000 men and women who are venerated as saints by Catholics throughout the world. Like St. Stephen, Colby is considered a martyr, that is, someone who died for his Christian beliefs. But unlike St. Stephen, Colby's life had to be formally investigated before he could be canonized. Over the centuries, the qualifications for sainthood have changed, but all saints share certain traits in common. They are loving persons. They may have lots of other imperfections, but when they love, uh, they are the real thing. We consider a saint somebody who's either given his life or his face. He was placed before a choice, either to do something against his Christian conscience or else to be killed. Saints have, um, from the very beginning, been identified with martyrdom. That is to say, it wasn't enough to live like Jesus. First of all, you had to die like Jesus. And that is just what St. Stephen did. Like Jesus, he was put on trial and given the chance to make a deal, his religious convictions for his freedom. Like Jesus, he refused and forfeited his life. In the years to come, thousands more will follow Stephen in choosing death. Saul will be one of them. Soon, on his way to Damascus to ferret out Christians, Saul will have an encounter with a blinding light and a voice. Transformed by the miracle, he will leave Damascus himself a Christian with a new name, Paul. And though, like Stephen, he will later pay with his life, Paul will lead this heretical new religion to victory and influence every generation of Christian thinkers to this day. When we read the story of Stephen, we see that it's very much the story of Jesus all over again, which is to say he's preaching, he's witnessing, uh, he is falsely accused, um, he is, uh, uh, goes through the same thing that Jesus does, and he finally dies. If indeed the teaching of Christianity was that one was to emulate or somehow imitate Christ, the imitatio Christi, then in fact the call to Christians was to become martyrs because this was 
the ultimate way to, to really imitate Christ. Over the next 30 years, the small Christian communities springing up throughout the Mediterranean, in Cyprus, Asia Minor, and Greece, will multiply. There will be sporadic persecutions and even the occasional martyrdom, though nothing widespread or systematic. But that is about to change. Rome, about 64 AD, at least as Hollywood imagines it. The upper levels of Roman society are increasingly bored and corrupt, attitudes that filter down to the lower classes. And everyone likes to be entertained. One of the very curious things about the Romans is this enormous bloodthirst that they had for uh, games in which uh, animals fought animals or men fought men. Uh, their idea of a wonderful Saturday afternoon or whenever they went to the game was to go out and watch people kill each other. The Romans who were committed pagans, if you will, polytheists, loved the spectacles as we love a football game today. Ancient Rome was in fact a very violent society. Their entertainments were violent and uh, they lived in, in a violent world. And no one likes a spectacle more than the Emperor Nero. But there was another kind of citizen living in Rome at the time, and they were different. They were members of a religious sect that worshipped a dead carpenter named Jesus. And the Romans weren't quite sure what to make of them. There were a number of um, charges made against the Christians. One was that they were antisocial. The Christians tended to meet uh, in secret. Uh, in the sense that they gathered early uh, in the morning for their worship uh, and so on. And the Romans were almost paranoid about secret societies. Now when you have a kind of a secret society, certain rumors are going to start. One rumor that started was that the uh, Christians were cannibals, and this was probably connected to Christian beliefs about the Eucharist, the bread and wine being the body and blood of Christ. The other was, uh, and this is almost always said about people that are secretive about their lives, that they were sexually promiscuous. It was in this atmosphere of suspicion and mistrust that Nero decided to create the greatest spectacle of all, Rome of Flame. is in ruins. When word gets out that Nero himself may have set the fire, the mood in the streets gets ugly. Nero needs a scapegoat, and he finds one. I hereby proclaim that the guilt of the burning of our beloved city rests with the foul sect which calls itself Christian. Their punishment will be a warning. An official edict is the answer. Spectacle And the rest, as they say, is history. And while it may not have happened quite like it does in the movies, there's no doubt that something very much like this did actually occur. We have a very specific description of, of what Nero did. Tacitus says that one of the things that Nero did was to pour pitch or tar on the Christians and hoist them up on poles and set them on fire to act uh, as ways of illuminating uh, the gardens. He also says that 
he would uh, tie them up in uh, the um, skins of wild animals and set hunting dogs on them. And uh, Tacitus, who did not like the Christians at all, uh, thought they were just another uh, wacky superstition, uh, uh, says in the annals, he says that uh, nonetheless, as bad as they were, people sort of pitied them, not so much because they agreed with them, but because of the cruelty uh, with which they were treated. And by all accounts, the Christians faced death with an uncommon courage and grace. They are singing! No one knows exactly how many Christians died during this first wave of persecutions. But St. Paul, the man who had watched the stoning of St. Stephen just 30 years earlier, was almost certainly among them. So was St. Peter, one of the 12 original disciples and tens of thousands more would follow. By the middle of the second century, the Christian writer Tertullian could dryly and truthfully observe, if the Tiber should flood its banks, or the stars stood still, or the earth trembled, the cry in the streets was always the same, Christians to the lions. In the second and third centuries AD, the Christian martyrdoms continued, though at a slightly less feverish pace than back in the days of Nero. The usual reason for executing a Christian was his or her refusal to honor the Roman gods. The Romans had this very strong sense of what was called pietas. We somewhat flaccidly translate that into piety but it meant the kind of the fear and respect that children should have for a parent, that the family then should have for the state, and that the state should have for the gods. And when pietas functioned, then there was peace in the empire. And the Christians, in a sense, subverted that because they would not show pietas towards the Roman gods. We actually possess uh, some uh, court records of trials of Christians. They're very, very brief. And they simply say, um, are you a Christian? Yes. Uh, will you uh, abjure that faith? No. And the prefect will then send someone to be executed. And each time someone dies, the stories of who they were and how they met their end are circulated. One first-hand account comes to us from 21-year-old Perpetua, imprisoned with her pregnant slave girl, Felicity. The mother of an infant, Perpetua chose to die rather than renounce her faith, in spite of the pleas of her pagan father. She said goodbye to her father and her child and prepared to die. As she waited, Perpetua recorded a series of visions in her diary. In some, she triumphed over dragons and pagans. In another, her long-dead brother appeared. On the day before the games, Perpetua had a final vision of herself being stripped and then vanquishing an evil-looking Egyptian in hand-to-hand -hand combat. At that moment, she wrote, I awoke, and I perceived that I would not be fighting with beasts, but with the devil, and I knew that victory was mine. For Perpetua and Felicity, the end was supposed to come on the horns of a mad bull. It gored Perpetua first, then went after Felicity. The women struggled to their feet several times, 
but the animal would not finish them off. In the end, Felicity was beheaded. Then a clumsy young gladiator tried to behead Perpetua, but only maimed her. Finally, she herself guided the sword to her neck, welcoming death in the name of Christ. The martyrs felt, in a way, almost free to invite death, and that's exactly what they went about doing. Uh, many of them exhorted uh, the authorities to kill them. We see uh, all kinds of, of wild stories, really, of uh, martyrs uh, who literally, almost laughingly, went before the Roman uh, authorities, uh, refused to sacrifice to the pagan gods, and thereby invited death. Uh, and when death came, again, embracing it. Uh, you see stories of St. Lawrence, for instance, the famous martyr who was grilled alive on a, on a gridiron. And at one point, this is kind of a, a strange story, but at one point, uh, he declares himself done on one side and asks to be flipped over. Uh, Ignatius was uh, one of those people who really seemed to welcome death, uh, wrote letters to the Romans telling them that he wished to be, and I quote, ground between the teeth of the wild beast that he might be the purebred of Christ. Um, so he's, he's looking forward to the agonizing death that, that presumably awaited him in the arena as, as the lions and, and, and other wild animals would tear him limb from limb. And there were others. Roman soldiers found Sixtus II preaching to his flock in the catacombs under the Appian Way. He was beheaded where he sat. The beautiful young Agatha spurned the advances of a Roman consul. Enraged, he had her stretched on a rack, had her breasts cut off, and finally ordered her thrown naked onto burning coals. Sebastian was a Christian who rose to a high rank in the emperor's personal guard. When the emperor found out, he ordered Sebastian used for target practice. Apollonia was attacked by a mob and thrown on a bonfire for refusing to curse Christ, but not before they broke out all her teeth. She is remembered as the patron saint of toothaches. The persecutors of 17-year-old Venantius whipped him, hung him upside down over a fire, smashed his jaw, then threw him to the lions, who showed no interest. In the end, they had to cut off his head to silence his prayers. Yet, in spite of all the bloodshed, the number of Christians continued to grow. Martyrdom, uh, in a sense, promoted Christianity. People would learn of the, of the gruesome deaths of these people, and, and in vivid detail, they love to, of course, relate all of the various tortures and the bloodshed and whatnot. And folks would hear of this and they'd say, gee, you know, that Christianity, that's powerful stuff. How can I get in on this? Christianity, um, became an answer to the problem of death. Uh, it's the God who dies, suffers and dies for others. And it was that aspect of Jesus. I mean, it was considered it an honor to die a martyr. By the year 70, Christians are active in Spain. By the year 100, in the area of the Black Sea. Early in the second century, there are Christians in France and Great Britain. Christianity grew almost by cell division, little house churches breaking off into further house churches, etc. They formed networks of communities for people, and I think that was also a very attractive part of early Christianity. And one of the things that the Christians did do was to provide within their communities care for the most vulnerable people uh, in the community, which were widowed women and children and orphans and the elderly. The Christians were getting organized, with power invested in the hands of local bishops. And even bishops could be martyrs. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, was among the second generation of disciples, those who had known the apostles, but not Jesus himself. Polycarp was 86 when a violent persecution broke out. When the Romans came for him, 
He invited them to share his meal, then went willingly. He told friends not to be concerned. He had already foreseen his martyrdom in a flame. He would be taken to the arena and, after refusing three times to renounce his faith, he would be burned alive. According to eyewitnesses, when the flames rose up, they formed gentle sails around Polycarp, as if refusing to touch his flesh. Eventually, the Romans stabbed the old man to death. And when they did, it said, a dove flew forth from his side. It was intended that nothing whatever of Polycarp remain. But secretly, his followers retrieved and hid some of his bones. A new chapter in the history of martyrdom had begun. When Polycarp's followers reclaimed his bones from the fire, they were acting on a mixture of beliefs, partly pagan, partly Christian. It had to do with what was considered sacred. This was a sacred world, by which I mean that it was commonly held by everyone in the Roman Empire, and in fact, almost among all ancient peoples, that the sacred could erupt into ordinary life in many different ways. The sacred could manifest itself in springs, in rivers, in forests, in woods, at certain corners, at certain times of the year. Christians extended this belief in the general sacredness of the natural world to include the body, especially the body of a martyr. Polycarp's bones, and the bones of all martyrs, were especially sacred. They had power, the power to intercede with God. If you prayed over the bones of a martyr, the faithful believed, God was more likely to hear your prayers and answer them. What happened in Christianity is that when the martyrs died, their uh, bodies were buried in, in Christian cemeteries, and people on the anniversary of their date of death, which they interestingly called their birthday, the Dies Natalis, that is the day when they were born into heaven, they would go and pray at these places. The idea was that because these were people who had died for the faith, these places were uh, loci of great spiritual power, that it was here that God particularly could be heard, that the power and the grace of the saints could intercede for people. The catacombs outside of Rome were one such place, though their function has been misinterpreted. Contrary to all those movies that you've seen on late night television, Christians did not hide out in the catacombs during the period of persecution. They were cemeteries, they were not even called catacombs in the Roman days, that was just the name of one of the catacombs. They were places for burial and Christians would go down there uh, on the um, day of the martyrdom of a saint and maybe offer religious services or visit these places, but they did not hide out. It's not like Christians were uh, like trolls living underground uh, hiding out from the Roman authorities. Plenty of people uh, saw the martyrdom, certainly heard about these passions of the martyrs, and then quickly came over to Christianity. I think it is one of the most important reasons why Christianity took over the crumbling Roman world in the third and fourth centuries AD. Uh, that and, of course, miracles, which were also a wonderful propaganda and, and public relations device as well. With miracles, one hears of supernatural events uh, performed by these leaders of this infant sect. And, and again, it, these wondrous deeds, they are appealing to people in the ancient world. So in that sense, martyrdom and miracle, both of those, uh, those, those means were, were terrific you know, advertising uh, devices and, and, and public relations devices. Then at the beginning of the fourth century, the Emperor Constantine had a vision that would change the world. 
In the sky, he saw a brilliant cross inscribed with the words, in this sign, conquer. He took it to mean that if he accepted Christianity, he would triumph in battle. When he did win, he quickly instituted a policy of religious tolerance throughout the Roman Empire. From about the year 320 on, the persecutions virtually ended. Now the Christians were free to seek out converts, and once again, the martyrs would play a pivotal role. It's very interesting that the word pagan comes from the Latin word pagus, meaning the village or the countryside, so that in the Christian vocabulary, the pagani, that is the non-believers, were people who basically lived out in the country. In the beginning of the fourth century, probably 30% of the population uh, was uh, Christian. Christianity was mainly located in the cities, but the idea of effectively Christianizing the outlying districts and the country districts and whatnot, that took a long time. Some historians have argued that uh, the countryside was never effectively uh, Christianized. What you do see, beginning in the fourth century uh, on, is the uh, great influence of these uh, shrines of the martyrs. From the fourth century on, Christianity began to move north. In this largely pagan world, the Christian cult of the saint became a powerful force, connecting people still close to the gods of the forest and sky. It was very common as the Christian church began to evangelize uh, out of the traditional areas of the Roman Empire that the Christians would destroy the pagan temples and then over those temples build Christian churches and in tear maybe the bones of part of the bones or part of the body of a martyr. What developed was a system of shrines, local spiritual power centers, each built around the story of a saint and their relics. Without relics, a church wasn't considered a church. In fact, at the beginning of the ninth century, according to ecclesiastical law, any local church that didn't have the bones of a saint in the altar could be torn down. Predictably, the demand for relics intensified. What happened if you were a Christian and you happened to live in a town where you didn't have a martyr's grave? Well, the tendency was then was to was to maybe find a martyr's body and move it to, to your place uh, in order to also have a sacred place where uh, the power of these martyrs uh, could be experienced by people. The bones of the early martyrs were considered especially powerful. Untold thousands were stolen from the catacombs of Rome. The skeleton of a single saint might be broken up and peddled to a number of different churches. This had the effect of encouraging the traffic in relics, both legal and illegal. If you couldn't find an extra martyr around, and this was very common in the early Middle Ages, you could always steal a body. And then, of course, it was inevitable that, that it would be maybe parts of body. But as powerful as the relics of the early martyrs were, the remains of a contemporary holy man could also produce miracles. Sheath your sword, Morville, before you impale your soul upon it. Especially if they, like Stephen and Perpetua and Polycarp, died defending the faith. With the spread of Christianity into new lands, the martyrs who became sainted were now not so much the oppressed as those defending their Christian domains or converting new ones. King Wenceslaus, good King Wenceslaus in the song, was murdered while trying to convert his pagan kingdom of Bohemia. In the British Isles, Oswald battled to bring all of England into the fold, only to be dismembered by a neighboring pagan king. 
Edmund of East Anglia died fighting off Viking invaders. All of these men became saints. The era of the political martyr was at hand. In the town square, beneath the shadow of Canterbury's great cathedral, a man is being whipped. Wielding the whips are the monks and bishops of Canterbury. And the man being whipped is Henry II, King of England. All of Europe has demanded this humiliation and the king has willingly submitted to it. All because, in a fit of pique, he once muttered that he wished an old friend dead. That friend was Thomas Beckett. Thomas Becket was popular in a sense after his death because he was a homegrown sort of a saint. Uh, he was the son of, of low-born Norman parents and he kind of rose through the ranks by the seat of his pants. As Becket seems to have had a certain charisma uh, and Henry himself, he seems to have been much taken with uh, Becket who was 15 years his senior. Uh, they rode together and, and, and uh, palled around together, that kind of thing. By the age of 24, Beckett had a well-known weakness for women and wine. Are you listening to me, Thomas? Mm -hmm. But 17 no. years later, against Beckett's own wishes, Henry named him the most powerful churchman in England, the Archbishop of Canterbury. My royal edict nominating you, Thomas Beckett, primate of England, Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Thomas, I'm in deadly earnest. My lord, don't do this. The day he became archbishop, he seems to have suddenly gotten religion. Uh, he began to wear a hair shirt underneath his, his robes. He began to eat frugally. And most importantly, he began actually to oppose Henry II on matters of church and state policy in England. Issues of church versus state steadily drove the two old friends apart. You, you can't allow. You can't stand by. Are you taking yourself seriously as Archbishop? I am the Archbishop, my prince. After excommunicating some members of Henry's court for mishandling church estates, Becket wisely fled to France. And I shall go back and fight with the weapons it has pleased you to give me. Six years later, he returned to England, only to find that Henry's son had been crowned prince in his absence, in direct violation of church law. Becket promptly excommunicated the bishops who had presided at the coronation. So long as he's alive, I tremble. I'm the king. The volatile Henry shouted that he wished to be rid of this troublesome prelate. A small group of knights within earshot decided to take the king at his word. On the evening of December 29th, 1170, four armed men appeared at Canterbury Cathedral and entered with their swords drawn. Breaking through a series of doors, they found Becket praying quietly at the altar. He had been expecting them. The knights demanded that he reinstate the excommunicated bishops. Becket declined. They attacked. The blow that killed Becket was delivered with enough force to shatter the sword 
and splatter the altar with his blood and brains. Within hours of the murder, we uh, hear of peasants and other people kind of moving into the church quietly and trying to pick up bits of Beckett's skull and sopping rags in his blood to take away, of course, his relics, holy relics, which uh, almost immediately began to perform miracles. Beckett was officially made a saint three years after his murder. And the year after that, the repentant king received his public whipping. In this first defining power struggle between the English church and the English state, the church had won. And so had the people of Canterbury. Now they had their very own martyr, with all the power that entailed. There were 703 miracles attributed to him, at least in the 10 years after his death. So his tomb became the favorite pilgrimage spot in England, <clears throat> and in fact was one of the most popular in Europe. Um, Louis VII of France, for instance, was the first French king to visit English soil uh, during the um, latter part of the 12th century, and he came to visit the shrine of Thomas and Becket, so perhaps one of the most popular pilgrimage shrines of, of, of all time. But it wouldn't be long before the French had their own heroic martyr, an unlikely warrior who would lead France to victory over Britain and thereby become one of the most famous saints of all time. She was born to peasant farmers in a small French village by the River Meuse. She was the fourth of five children. Her name was Joan. For the first 13 years of her life, no one noticed anything particular about the girl, except that she tended to be modest and pious. Just a normal child who was about to change history. Joan was 14 when she began hearing voices. They told her she had been chosen to lead the French army to victory over the British. Naturally, no one believed her. But there's not one person in the world, not among kings or nobles or princesses who can bring help to the France we love. Not one save this maid you see before you. It's not because of anything in me, but because the King of Heaven wishes it so. Huh. Well, that's the point. That's the point. But I am to lead the Dauphin's armies. To lead his armies? When did the Dauphin have an army? Eventually, Joan got an audience with the heir to the French throne, the Dauphin. To his amazement, she was able to pick him out of a crowd, though they had never met. has spoken to me through his messengers. And it is his will that I come to aid you and that you be king of France. But the Dauphin was skeptical until Joan privately told him something, no one knows what, that convinced him she had been sent by God. Joan was put in charge of the French army and promptly led her troops to victory in the Battle of Orléans. But when the Dauphin was finally crowned king, he turned out to be weak and indecisive and never pressed for a final victory over Britain. We have fought so hard and have given so much blood to win. His Majesty has signed the truce, and our king never repudiates his word. Shortly thereafter, Joan fell into the hands of the Duke of Burgundy, who sold her to the British 
so that she could be tried as a heretic. As far as the British were concerned, Joan was a witch. If you were a true Christian, you'd give her up for nothing. She's a sorceress, a heretic, an idolatress. She must be burned. In the face of merciless cross-examination, Joan continued to insist that she was only acting under orders from God. All I have done, I have done by the command of my Lord. That is all that I have done well. Eventually, she wavered and signed a confession of heresy, only to retract it a few days later. At 8 o'clock on the morning of May 30th, 1431, Joan was led to the marketplace of Rouen and burned at the stake. A sorceress, lying, seducing, pernicious, presumptuous, seditious, cruel, apostate. Her crime? Consorting with the devil. Witchcraft. She was not yet 20 years old. Within a few years of the execution, Joan's mother succeeded in reversing the judgment of the British ecclesiastical court that had condemned her daughter, though most Englishmen continued to regard Joan with suspicion. The interesting thing is, on the other side of the coin were the French, who, of course, uh, absolutely adored her. She became a, a, the patron saint of France. Uh, she was given much credit for the reversal of French fortunes in the Hundred Years' War. But instead of the three years it took Becket to be declared a saint, nearly 500 years had to pass before the same honor was accorded to Joan. Eventually, in 1920, she was canonized. So, uh, which is she, is, is, is my question. So if the one side politically sees her as a saint, the other side politically sees her as a heretic and a witch, which is it? Uh, and I think that uh, gives us some problems today um, and maybe speaks to uh, the canonization process and the fact that, in essence, humans are deciding who are saints and who are heretics, not God. Like the early martyrs, Joan had chosen to die rather than renounce her faith. But unlike the early martyrs, she was killed by an arm of the church itself. So what exactly does it mean to die for the faith? It's a question that is still being asked today, especially in the case of the Polish priest named Maximilian Kolbe. Maximilian Kolbe was born in 1894 to a poor family in a small Polish town, the second of five children. Around the age of 10, he had a remarkable vision. In it, the Virgin Mary came to him, offering two roses. One was white, signifying purity. The other red, signifying martyrdom. Little Maximilian eagerly accepted them both. He told no one but his mother. He grew up, entered the Franciscan order, and was sent to Rome to study, earning doctorates in philosophy and theology. He was ordained in 1918, while the world still rumbled with the aftershocks of World War I. Colby returned to Poland, where he founded a popular Catholic magazine, created the world's largest friary, and even founded a mission in Japan. When the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939, Kolbe flung open the doors of his immense friary to thousands of Jewish refugees. It was said he never turned away a single person in search of a safe haven. But he was a marked man. In 1941, the Nazis arrested him for treason and sent him to the concentration camp at Auschwitz. There, he shared his meager rations with others and comforted those who had lost their relatives, their friends, and sometimes their faith. Achtung, Achtung! The announcement began like all others. Achtung, 
Achtung! Von euch wird jeder Zehnte verurteilt, an Hunger zu sterben. A prisoner from cell block 14 had escaped, and in reprisal, ten of his cellmates must die. Forty-year-old Polish army sergeant Francis Gajownicek heard his number called. But I have a wife and children, he cried out. Without fear or hesitation, Father Kolbe stepped forward and urged that the Nazis kill him instead. Good. To the commandant, it made no difference who died. Gajownicek stepped back into line. Kolbe stepped forward into sainthood. And although Kolbe was by no means the only person to make such a heroic sacrifice, word of what he had done spread through the camp like wildfire. As one Auschwitz survivor later testified, we became aware that someone among us in this spiritual dark night of the soul was raising the standard of love on high. Someone unknown, tortured, and bereft of name and social standing went to a horrible death for the sake of someone not even related to him. We were stunned by this act, which became for us a mighty explosion of light in the dark camp. And yet, as far as the church was concerned, Colby did not die a martyr for the Catholic faith in the strict sense of the term. That is, he was not singled out for death because of any particular animosity towards his beliefs. He took the place of a married person and said, take me, I'm not married, I'm a priest. And he died a horrible death and he spiritually nurtured the people around him. In fact, he held out so long, they, I think they had to give him a lethal dose. But the point was, did he die for the faith? They didn't come forward and say, hey, priest, you're a priest, we're going to murder you. No, he took the place of, he gave his life for another. This left the church in an awkward position. One could not hear Colby's story without knowing instinctively that he was a saint. And yet, technically, he was not a martyr of the faith. In the Vatican, the Pope, himself a Pole, wrestled with the problem. Father Peter Gumpel was one of the official judges of Colby's case. I had warned the Pope, Your Holiness, I can't see that I can come to a positive conclusion about a martyrdom unless you enlarge the concept of martyrdom. Because Kolbe offered his life in substitution of a hostage who was condemned to death. And this was accepted. So we suggested that uh, the, con the traditional concept of martyrdom, therefore being killed, as you would say, technically in odium fidei, would be enlarged that also somebody who has given his life to save the lives of others could be declared a martyr. And this theory was accepted, and in this sense, Kolbe was canonized as a martyr. And so the new pope, citing Kolbe as a personal hero, created a new definition of martyrdom, that of charity. Martyrdom, it turns out, isn't just an old-fashioned concept. In the 20th century, there are still people willing to die because their faith demands it. You know, we tend to romanticize the early martyrs. I mean, we have uh, stained glass windows with virginal saints looking up to heaven with a palm branch, you know, while lions are sort of coyly situated around them. But if we were going to do stained glass windows today of the martyrs of the 20th century, uh, we wouldn't use uh, lions and crowns and palm leaves. We would have barbed wire electrodes on people's genitals and uh, starvation pits and gas chambers and uh, bullets and so on. In order to give oneself over to this kind of physical pain and do so again gladly, almost laughingly, uh, requires a tremendous amount of courage. Uh, we 
sit in our modern day, and, and few of us are willing to sacrifice ourselves in that way. I, I you know, speaking personally, I would, if when they called for martyrs, I would get out of the way. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of us are that way in, in today's secular world. It, it requires a tremendous devotion, a tremendous commitment to faith uh, to go through that kind of thing. Um, and that's maybe a faith and a, and a commitment to it that we just don't have in today's world. I don't know, some may, but um, yeah, tremendous courage. It takes guts to be a martyr. All of the earlier martyrs were first and foremost real people. Flesh and blood human beings with an abiding belief in the message of Jesus Christ. From humble beginnings in shadowy corners of Jerusalem, the Christian community grew and multiplied. When called upon, many Christians willingly gave up their lives. Over the centuries, through their extraordinary faith, courage, and capacity for sacrifice, the martyr saints did nothing less than change the world forever.